Hi, this is Usha. Welcome to Rathod's IAS classes. Today in this lecture, we are going to discuss current affairs of 7th February 2022. In this lecture, overall we are going to discuss 10 topics which are very much relevant from our UPSC point of view. So let us have a brief introduction. So first topic it is about hijab. Okay. So recently what happened six students who wear this hijab they were mainly sent out of the class from this Karnataka UDP district. Okay. So because of this this hijab it is in news. So we need to know about right to freedom and even we can talk about right to religious freedom. Okay. Uh, so here this article is important from our polity point of view which mainly comes in a GS paper too. And next topic it is about weighing on a health data retention plan. So it is talking about data retention. So as you all know that in India there is no data protection law that is present. Okay. So because of this here right to privacy that will come into conflict. Already you know that this right to privacy is a fundamental right. Right. So because of this here we need to know about some issues regarding this uh, data storage. So this is important from your health point of view which mainly comes at a GS paper too. So because we are mainly talking about health data. And next article it is about fixing frequencies first. Actually this article which is talking about this 5G plan. In recent budget our finance minister she made some statements regarding this 5G technology. So here we need to talk about this in detail. So this is important from our governance point of view. And next topic it is regarding India and Central Asian relations. So recently we saw that um, in India Central Asia summit that mainly happened. So regarding this, so this article which mainly talking about benefits and challenges. So we are going to discuss that. So that will be important from our international relations which mainly comes in the GS paper too. And next topic it is about center to tweak no build zone around monuments. So this article is very important okay from our history point of view which mainly comes in a GS paper one. And next topic it is about China Pakistan they hit out at unilateral Kashmir moves. So this is about in uh, China and Pakistan regarding this Kashmir issue. So this article is important again from our international relations which mainly comes under GS paper two. So now let us try to talk about these topics in a very great detail and now let us try to start our discussion with the court. So this court which is regarding poverty. Already you know that this poverty is also one of the favorite topic of UPSC. So you need to be prepared regarding some courts regarding favorite topics of UPSC like education, poverty, women, empowerment, environment, science and technology, right? So here if you are talking about this uh, poverty, the court which mainly says that as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world none of can uh, none of us can truly rest okay so as long as poverty injustice and inequality that is persist in our world so none of us can uh, truly rest so this is the which is a quote which is given by this nelson mandela and the Nelson Mandela quotes are very important and you can also easily remember those quotes and try to focus on quotes and now let us try to see the first topic it is regarding hijab so title says the interpretive answer to hijab row so this article it is very important from your polity point of view so now let us try to discuss this topic so if you are talking about what is this hijab hijab it is nothing but so the covering which is mainly used to cover the face especially by the muslims so this is called as hijab okay so if you see what is the context context mainly says that recently six students they were banned entering a college in karnataka udp district the reason here is wearing of hijab hijab it is nothing but a head covering so cloth which is mainly used to cover their head so this is called as hijab okay so because of this okay because of this context we can see that led to issue regarding legal questions that led to legal questions regarding freedom of religion and whether the right to wear a hijab it is a constitutionally protected or not okay so because of this now the questions which are mainly seen regarding this are freedom of religion and as well as right to wear a hijab it is constitutionally protected or not so now let us try to talk about constitutional provisions regarding this freedom of religion so in our constitution Fundamental rights are guaranteed under part 3 of our Indian constitution and but these fundamental rights are not absolute. 
right so there are some exceptions and reasonable restrictions that we can see on this fundamental rights so if you're talking about article which is talking about right to freedom uh, sorry religious freedom here is article 25 1 okay article 25 subclass 1 of constitution which mainly talks about freedom of concise and right to freely possess profess practice and as well as propagate religion so regarding this uh, freedom of religion article 25 subclass 1 which mainly talks about right freely uh, it is a right which mainly talks about freely to profess and practice and as well as propagate the religion so it is a right which mainly guaranteed a negative liberty that means the state shall ensure that there is no interference or obstacle to exercise this freedom okay so this is about this right to religious freedom so however if you're talking about fundamental rights are not absolute so there might be some reasonable restrictions that will be imposed by the state so here state have uh, power to restrict the right on the grounds of public order decency morality health and as well as other state interest as well so these are the some basics regarding this right to religious freedom so what are the implications the first one is it mainly talking about freedom of concise that means for example i am believing so and so god it is my concise okay it is like my concise whether believing of god it is uh, it is your choice okay whether you can believe or you cannot believe so it is called as freedom of conscience so freedom of conscience it is nothing but inner freedom of an individual to mold his relationship with god or creatures whatever we say he decides so whatever i will decide regarding any creature or god so what is the relationship that is present that is the inner freedom this is called as freedom of conscience if you're talking about right to profess right to profess means declaration of one's religious belief for example i can declare like i am a hindu or i am a christian or i am i am a uh, muslim like that so here declaration of one's religious beliefs and faith openly and freely that is called as right to profess and next one is right to practice the performance of a religious uh, worship ritual ceremonies and even exhibition of uh, beliefs and ideas so that will mainly comes under this right to practice and next one is right to propagate so if we're talking about propagate means transmission and dissemination of one's religious belief to other or exposition of tenets of one's religion so that will mainly comes under this right to propagate that means i am very much free to transmit my my religious beliefs or disseminate my religious beliefs that will be comes under this right to propagate okay so but the, but conversion will not come under this uh, right to propagate okay so this is uh, about implications from this uh, from this uh, freedom of religious uh, okay that is right to freedom or uh, religious freedom and if you are talking about here whenever we are talking about this uh, with question regarding this right to religious freedom so we need to talk about this essential religious practice test so what is this essential religious practice test means over years over years supreme court mainly evolved evolved or came up with a practice test of sort to determine what religious practices can be constitutionally protected so what can be ignored so already you know that this religious freedom which is mainly present in our fundamental rights which mainly comes under our part 3 of our indian constitution so but but we don't know which one is constitutionally protected and which one is exempted right so because of the supreme court came up with this practical test which mainly determines religious practices that can be constitutionally protected and which can be ignored under this okay exceptions so in 1954 for the first time supreme court held in famous case that is shirur mukt mut case that the term religion will cover all rituals and practices and these rituals and practices they are integral to the religion okay so these rituals and practices they are integral to religion and the test to determine what is integral is termed as is essential religious practice test so when we want to determine which is integral so we will be applying this essential religious practice test okay so by this test a judicial determination of religious practices has been often criticized okay so whenever we are taking any step means always and we can see there will be the criticism will be following 
so many people they will be criticizing this test okay so criticism mainly includes that scholars mainly agree, agree that it is better for court to prohibit religious practices for public order rather than determine what is so essential to the religion that it needs to be protected okay so criticism here mainly says that so many scholars they mainly agree that it is better for the court to prohibit religious practices for public order so here rather than going for determining which is essential which is not essential which can be ignored like that rather than this here scholar mainly agree that to prohibit this religious practices for this public order so in several instances that means in many ways here court has applied the test to keep certain practices out that means ignoring of practices so in 2004 ruling supreme court held that especially in this anand marga sect so anand marga sect had no fundamental right to perform tandava dance in public streets okay it is not comes under the essential religious practice okay so there is a no fundamental right of performing this tandava dance and while these issues are largely understood to be community based there are instances in which court has applied the test to individual freedoms as well so in many a times actually this religious will be the community based right so here issues are largely based on the community and sometimes even court applied this test especially to test individual freedoms also so if you are talking about some examples where individual freedom which is mainly tested by the court here is in 2016 supreme court held that the discharge of muslim airman from indian air force for keeping a beard okay so here supreme court upheld that discharge of muslim airman from indian air force for keeping a beard and not only that armed forces regulation 1964 act which mainly prohibits the growth of hair by armed forces personnel except except for the personnel whose religious prohibits the cutting of hair or shaving of face so even we are having number of acts which are mainly interfering with this religious freedom so if you are talking about this armed forces regulation 9, act of 1964 which mainly prohibits the growth of hair by armed persons okay armed personnel except for the persons whose religions prohibit the cutting of hair or shaving of a face so if we are talking about court judgments regarding this so first and the foremost thing here is so there were number of rulings that mainly seen in this kerala high court particularly regarding right of muslim women to wear dress according to the tenets of islam okay so here there are many cases which are mainly filed in this kerala high court regarding rights of muslim women to dress according to the tenets of islam so later on in 2015 so at least two petitions they were filed before this kerala high court again challenging the dress code challenging the dress code for all india pre medical entrance test which mainly prescribed for wearing of light clothing uh, clothes with half sarees and not having big buttons brooch or badge flower etc so even if you have attempted your neat examination you might be knowing that so they will be not allowing even a hair pin or ear rings or any metals because they they mainly want to decrease the mal practices right so even in this cbs that is central board for uh, board of social uh, school education so it is cbs that is central board of school education so in this cbs also rule was only to ensure that candidates would not use unfair methods so whenever they are using for thick clothing or whenever they are using burkas or whenever the uh, students are using uh, flower pins or anything so that that might be used for this uh, mal practices okay because we are using high technology now so because of this high technology there might be the high or number of chances of this uh, mal practices had been increased mainly to use and mainly to ensure that there will be no mal practice or unfair methods so these are the some important uh, guidelines which came up by cbs and as well as neat and next important famous case here is amna bent bashir versus central board of secondary school education 2016 so here in this uh, case kerala high court which mainly examined the issue more closely and court said that practice of wearing hijab constitute an essential religious practices 
but it did but it did not quash the cbse rule so whenever we are going for a wearing of this hijab so this hijab it is a one of the essential practice of of muslims or islam right so court once again allowed for the additional measures and safeguards to be put in place in 2015 but the issue of uniform prescribed by school it is one of the another bench ruled different differently in this fatima versus state of kerala so here so here in this famous case that is amna amna bint bashir versus cbse kerala high court which mainly said that practice of wearing this hijab mainly constitutes under the essential practices okay but it did not quash the cbse rule but in this fatima versus state of kerala case of 2018 a single bench of this kerala high court held that collective rights of a institution would be given primacy over individual rights so over individual rights the collective rights of an institution will be given more priority so this is the one important thing that mainly said by this high court of kerala so these are the some important things that you need to remember regarding this topic and now let us move on to the next topic so title says weighing in on a health data retention plan so this article which is mainly talking about storage of this health related data and how it is breaching this right to privacy so now let us try to see this topic in a very great detail so this topic it is important from your health and even from your polity point of view which mainly comes in a gs paper too so if you're talking about why it is in news so already you know that here we have this national health authority so this national health authority it is a body which is mainly responsible for administering of this ayushman bharat digital mission okay so already you know uh, some facts regarding this ayushman bharat mission right so we are not going to talk about details regarding this ayushman bharat so it is your duty to discuss or uh, and as well as you ha- here it is your duty to uh, revise and here you did here it is your duty to research regarding some facts regarding this ayushman bharat digital mission okay already we discussed about that topic number of times so now you can revise them easily so if you are talking about this ayushman bharat digital mission so it is a one of the important initiative which is mainly started by government of india and it is the responsibility of this national health authority mainly regarding the retention of this health data by health care providers in india so for example if i am going to any hospital okay if i am going to any hospital for any issue there will be the prescription that will be given by the doctor and doctor will be prescribing some test and as well as he will be giving some medicines so that data which is mainly recorded with this healthcare providers so it is the responsibility of this national health authority regarding this administering of this ayushman bharat digital mission and this consultation paper which mainly ask for feedback on what data it is to be retained and how long so whenever i am giving my data regarding my health status so which data which is mainly recorded whether the medicine data or whether the test which is prescribed by the pretty uh, practitioner or whether the lab data and lab report so there is no proper uh, clarity regarding which data which is retained and if there is a data which is mainly taken in by them so how long they will go for uh, preserving of that data so these are the some important questions which are mainly posed and if you are talking about is this system it is a simple classification system it mainly suggested in consultation paper which mainly exposes individuals to harm arising up from over collection and retention of unnecessary data so whenever there is collection of unnecessary data or whenever there is storage of unnecessary data is happening means so it will be also leading to some harms for the individual and even it is a not an efficient process as well so at the same time at the same time the kind of one size fits all the system can also leads to under retention of the data so for example if you are coming uh, if you are coming up with the, see this aishman digital health system means so if you are coming up with one one system and this one system can be implemented in the different states throughout the country means so it will be not much helpful okay so at the same time whenever we are coming up with this one size fits all the system that can also leads to under retention of data okay so whenever you are coming with one one system and when we are asking that all the states need to follow that means it will also leads to under retention of data so instead we need to seek classifying of data we need to come up with the classification of data and we can also use this uh, 
you, you can also use which is data which is required and which data it is not required and based on that unidentified data or, uh, or unusual data that need to be deleted. So if we're talking about why, why, why we need to return this data or why we need to store this data. So if you're talking about Supreme Court of India, which mainly clarified that right to privacy is a fundamental right in famous K.S. Puttaswamy judgment in 2017. So because of this, whenever we want to go for uh, storing of data or retention of data, so it need to be based on the four part test. So first one is based on legality. Second one is legitimate plan. Next one is proportionality and, third, and last one is appropriate safeguards. So based on this four part test, we need to go for retention of data. And if you're talking about this mandatory retention of data, it is a one such forms of interference with the right to privacy. So whenever we are going for the retention of data or storage of data, it is also having some impact on this right to privacy. And already you know that this right to privacy is a fundamental right, right? So in this context, the question of legality, which mainly becomes a question about legal standing and authority of this national, national health authority. So now it became the one of the important question regarding this legal standing and also last authority of this national health authority. So here this is the one important thing that you need to remember. And if you're talking about what will be the benefits. So the important benefit here is whenever we are having the data regarding this health, then that will be helpful, especially when we want to go for uh, when we want to go for any research and innovation. So and we can go for analyzing of the data. For example, if you are talking about a smoking, smoking which, which leads to cancer, already we know that. So if you are having data regarding this cancer patients and we can analyze how many of these cancer patients are going for this smoking, whether this smoking has really effect on this cancer or not. So which, uh, which type of cancer which is associated with this smoking. So in this way, we can go for data analysis as well. We can do research and innovation. So for this, data retention is very, very important. And if you're talking about what are the risks, so whenever we are going for storaging of this data and if there is improper disclosure of this data is happening, then what happened that will mainly affect this right to privacy of that so and so individual, right? And there is also leaking of the individual entire health and as well as medical record data. So because of this, it will be also have some negative impact. And if you're talking about possible safeguards, what can be done? So first one is, we can go for retaining data, okay? We can go for retaining data and that data, whatever we are going for storage of that data, that should be clear, okay? And here we need to know about what are the reasons for this retention of this data and that need to be, that need to be explained to the patients and as well as we need to go for taking of consent from the patients, okay? So whenever we are going to collect the data from the patients for especially for research purposes, okay and we need to we need to see that unnecessary data should be deleted such that the storage problem will not be arise and even we need to take some informed consent from the individual before collecting the data and as well as before storing that data and even healthcare providers healthcare service providers and any and everyone else will have to comply with this data protection law so as of now in india we do not have proper data protection law okay so once it come into picture we need to comply with this data protection law okay and next one is recently the current bill which is mainly already required which means mainly introduced in the parliament and it requires a proposed litigation regarding collecting processing and sharing and as well as retaining the data and we can go for classification of this uh, data process and finally we can use in this uh, ayushman bharat digital um, digital initiative as well so this is just of this topic and I hope it is very much clear. Now let us try to see next topic it is regarding 5G technology. So this article it is very important regarding governance which mainly comes under GS paper 3 or oh, GS paper 2. And we can also talk about this 5G technology in our science and technology as well. So now let us try to understand what is this 5G technology. So before that let us try to see the evaluation okay evolution of this uh, 5G technology. So first we had this 1G technology during 1980s, okay, so by using this 1G technology we used to have the just mobile calls from human to human, okay, through phones and as we got this 2G technology, so 2G technology is mainly came up in year 1990s and here we have digital voice that is we have low speed data that is also available here 
and next one is 3G technology and the most of you might be using 3G and 4G technology now right so during this 2000s we came with this 3G technology and through this 3G technology we have this mobile broadband and even we have some high speed data and we also have some internet access as well and now especially we are using this 4G phones so in this 4G it mainly came up in 2010 and it is mainly focusing on the faster or better 3G IP based network systems and later on now recently we are talking about this 5G technology in 2020s so it is mainly focusing on interconnecting of devices, scanners and as well as system so in this way we will be having wide range of applications of this 5G technology and if you are talking about what are the features of this 5G technology so before seeing these features now let us try to see what is this 5G technology so if you are talking about this 5G technology it is nothing but 5th generation mobile network okay and it is one of the new global wireless standard after 1G, 2G, 3G and 4G and this 5G technology which also enables a new kind of network and that is mainly designed to connect virtually everyone and everything together including machines, objects and as well as devices okay so this 5G technology it is mainly enables a new kind of network and this network it is mainly designed to connect virtually everyone and even it will be helpful to connect everything together so even we can connect the machines objects and as well as devices like that and the speed will be very very fast when we are comparing with the top 4g technology as well so if you're talking about what are the features so first one here is we have the 100 times more devices so in the 100 times more devices that we can use this 5g technology and it is a very very fast and even we have very high capacity under this 5g technology and more software options to upgrade okay and next one is the connectivity will be ubiquitous that means we can see connectivity that will be present everywhere but if you see now we are facing challenges of this connectivity problems in especially rural areas there is no proper education access to rural areas and we will be having wide range of applications when we are using this 5g technology and the speed it is like up to 10 gbits okay gigabits and virtual latency will be zero so these are some important features and now let us try to see what is the context so recently our finance minister in budget announcement she mainly made a statement regarding this 5g technology so she said that mainly the government process to conduct the required spectrum auctions in 2022 okay government mainly proposes to conduct the required spectrum auctions in 2022 and they also talking to facilitate the roll out of this 5G technology phone services in fiscal year 2022 to 2023. So by 2020 to 2023, government want to roll out this 5G mobile technology. And government which is mainly very much keen regarding this 5G services, okay. And even we can see like finance minister is being propelled by an appreciation of latest generation of telecommunications, technology enability, etc. So here our finance minister mainly says that whenever we are going for this 5G technology that will be also having much impacts like that will be having some positive economic growth and even that will be leading to this job creation as well right. So these are the some important things which are mainly said and now finally uh, if you are talking about this telecom sector now we are seeing there is a duopoly that means Airtel and Airtel on one side and Geo on one side they are mainly ruling this telecom industry right so here because of this geopoly we can see other small private telecom service providers like for example Odafone so and so so they are mainly having some issues so they are having many issues like increasing of interest rates and there is no proper service that is mainly provided by this Vodafone okay so these are the some important things that mainly facing by this small telecom industries however even many countries they went for commercialization of this 5g services but whenever they went for this commercialization of this 5g services they started facing some challenges okay so first we need to know what are the challenges that will be and we need to come up with the working on that challenges and apart from that here if you are talking about this rolling of the 5g technology we need not only offer the key operational frequencies okay we need not to focus on only this operational frequencies but here government need to take steps regarding transport and as well as um, backhaul of signals between this base stations and as well as 
telecom partner as well okay and next one is with this covid 19 pandemic that entered into our life we are seeing there is a very very uh, small or existing mobile network in adequacy that is mainly seen so because of this here if you are talking about rolling out uh, out of this 5g technology that will be helpful especially for this economic payoff okay so this is just of this topic and i hope it is very much clear now let us try to see next topic title says india's return to central asia so actually this article talking about relationship between india and central asia so this topic is important from our international relations so now let us try to understand why central asia is important for india and what are the challenges we are facing so if you are talking about why it is in news so already you know that recently india central asian summit which mainly held and not only this we also came up with this india central asia dialogue and even we also came with regional security dialogue on afghanistan in new delhi so these are the some events which mainly held from last four months onwards so because of this events collectively which is mainly showing that so there is increasing of india's enthusiasm to engage with the central asian countries so here if you are talking about this great power dynamics so what is this great power dynamics that mainly led for the good relationship with, with uh, india and as well as the central asian countries so one of the important factors which is mainly driving the engagement and shaping of this relationship between india and central asian countries it is because of this great power dynamics so what are this great power dynamics so because of this decreasing or declining of american presence so because of this decline of american presence and also there is increasing of increasing of chinese uh, presence in this region and even we can see chinese domination that is seen in this geo economic landscape and russia it is one of the dominant political multi power in the region so because of all these reasons now we are mainly moving towards the central asian countries so if we talk about central asian region where it is exactly located it is mainly between this caspian sea okay caspian sea in the west of china and it is from uh, afghanistan okay afghan from afghanistan in the south to russia in the north so this is the location and if you talk about central asian countries we have five countries first one is kazakhstan kyrgyzstan tajikistan turkmenistan and uzbekistan so those these countries are collectively known as central asian republics as well so if you talking about why this region is important first one is for for minerals and as well as energy security so for our energy security so these countries are very important so all as you all know that these central asian countries they are mainly rich in energy resources for example oil coal and as well as natural gas resources and kazakhstan it is also the largest producer of uranium as well okay and uzbek and uzbekistan is also having large uranium reserves and you all know that india it is one of the big Im, big importer and as well as uh, import dependent country regarding this energy requirements so for this this central asian countries mainly offer some scope and next one is security so if we are talking about security terrorism drug trafficking and radicalization they have been a matter of concern for india okay india and as well as central asian countries okay so because of this so these countries are mainly coming towards each other and next one is geopolitical significance so unstable central asia has a potential effect mainly seen because of russia and as well as china and they are also sharing boundary or boundary with this uh, these countries so because of this the chinese increasing its influence in this india's neighborhood so because of this it is not a good sign for india so because of this here we need to move towards the central asian countries and if you are talking about trade and investment so the trade it is very very low here right and we have opportunities mainly to increase uh, trade between india and these countries especially in sectors like it sector pharmaceuticals tourism etc here and if you are talking about what are the initiatives which already taken by the government of india so we came up with this instc that is international north south transport corridor so india iran and russia in 2000 they launched this international north south transport corridor and this corridor which is mainly focusing to develop 
new trade routes okay new trade routes so if you are talking about this route it is from india iran and it is moving to azerbaijan and russia here and finally it is it is mainly returning through the sea route okay so it is mainly containing like uh, it is a multimodal project it will be containing like all weather highways and it mainly includes afghanistan azerbaijan central asia and as well as several european countries as well and second initiative here you know about this chabahar port initiative so in 2003 india and iran they announced the development of this chabahar port it is mainly serving as an alternate route so here we have pa here gwadar port in pakistan by using this gwadar port we can reach this afghanistan and as well as central asian countries but pakistan will not allow this and pakistan even will not allow the air space so because of this india which is came up with the alternate route of developing of this chabahar port in iran and through this iran we are connecting this afghanistan to rail route and as well as roadways and we can also connect this central asian regions with this chabahar port and next one is ashgabat agreement so this ashgabat pact which mainly signed in year 2011 mainly by uzbekistan turkmenistan iran oman and qatar so they are mainly focusing on developing of a short trade route between the central asian republics and iran and as well as oman ports so in this ashgabat agreement also india signed recently in 2018 and next one is tapi pipeline that is turkmenistan afghanistan pakistan india pipeline so here it was launched it was launched in may to transport natural gas from turkmenistan to india with a transit through afghanistan and pakistan okay so these are the some initiatives which already taken and if you talk about what are the challenges first one is these central asian countries or land lock countries that means they do not have direct connectivity with the seas or oceans here so because of this it is very very difficult to connect these central asian countries and this one is connectivity so regarding this uh, land and as well as maritime connectivity it is very very difficult and because of this we are coming up with some fear initiatives in digital connectivity as well and there is one more challenge here is there is increasing of presence of china because china which mainly shares border with these countries so because of this chinese influence that is mainly increased in this region and next one is taliban's presence in afghanistan so taliban's presence in afghanistan which is also increasing because afghanistan which is sharing bond with the central asian countries so because of this some type of influence that we can see in this area as well and next one is trade and commercial bonds so trade between india and central asia is very very low like us dollars 2 billion but if you are talking about trade between central asian countries and china it is like 100 billion dollars so these are the some important challenges as well so now let us try to see next topic it is regarding center to tweak no build zone around monuments so if you see this image you can see these are the qutub shahi tombs so if you are talking about tangible and intangible cultural heritage sites so here you have to refer those tangible and intangible cultural heritage site so which is a one separate chapter in your nitin singhania so please uh, revise that topic so this will be very relevant from this article so actually this article is important from gs paper 1 under art and culture point of view so if you are talking about why this is in news so 100 meter radius 100 meter radius around the centrally protected monuments for example here in this area we have any centrally protected monument is present so around this centrally protected monument till 100 meters so so there is any construction which is mainly prohibited okay which is mainly prohibited and this prohibited area that could be replaced with site specific limits to be decided by expert committee so actually according to the act that is ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act of 1958 so recently amended in 2010 which mainly says that if there is any centrally protected monument is present so till 100 meters of radius there will be no construction construction is prohibited and till 300 meters okay and till this 300 meters radius so here we have this area which mainly comes under this regulated area so this will be the regulated area and this will be the prohibited area till 100 meters okay so this is according to this act of the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and now there was one expert committee which mainly constituted and this expert committee which is mainly going to come up with the revised specific limits regarding this prohibited area and as well as regulated area so because of this this is in news 
okay so however what happened according to ministry officials as well as recent parliamentary standing committee report there was no specific reason for this 100 100 meter and as well as 300 meter limits so because of this they are coming up with the experts committee so now let us try to talk about some facts regarding this ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act 1958 so these are some provisions now we are going to discuss that might be your potential prelim statements so actually what is this act so this act mainly provides for preservation of ancient and historical monuments and even it includes archaeological sites which are of national importance so it includes ancient historical and as well as archaeological sites and even this act will provide for regulation of archaeological excavations okay it also provides for regulation of archaeological excavations and they will be also focusing on protection of sculptures uh, carvings etc and archaeological survey of india which mainly functions under this act actually so this act which mainly prohibits uh, area under construction like around 100 meters around this protected monument it will become under this prohibited area and this act does not provide or permit any construction in these prohibited areas if it is for public purposes okay for except under certain conditions so these iconic monuments in india for example taj mahal ajanta caves great stupa at sanchi and sun temple at konark so these are some of the ancient monuments of national importance which are mainly protected under this act and if you are talking about who is the custodian of these monuments custodian of these monuments is archaeological survey of india okay and the national monument authority will make a recommendation for construction of public works to the central government okay so these are the some important things that you need to remember and now let us try to see next topic it is regarding china pakistan hit out at unilateral kashmir nose so this article it is important from our international relations which mainly comes in the gs paper too actually what happened in kashmir so in kashmir especially in 2019 on august 5th 2019 so our government of India came up with revocation of article 370 of Indian constitution and it also came up with this Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act and it came up with the bifurcation of this erstwhile Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories. Okay, so union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, next one is union territory of Ladakh. So Jammu and Kashmir was given with legislative assembly and Ladakh did not have legislative assembly. So because of this move, because of this move of government of India, that is the vocation of this article 370, now China and Pakistan, they want to hit out unilateral Kashmir moves. So now let us try to see context. Actually, this Pakistan president, he visited this China in this winter Olympics, okay, to mainly for the inauguration of this winter Olympics. What happened here? So China and Pakistan, they said that they opposed this unilateral actions that complicate the Kashmir issue. So, because of this revocation of Article 370 and Kashmir is one of the dispute area between this India and Pakistan. So, Pakistan claims that this entire Kashmir, but India says that it is a part of integral part of India. So, here recently India came up with this changes regarding the revocation of this Article 370. So, because of this unilateral move of India, which mainly opposed by this unilateral, uh, opposed by this China and Pakistan. So, in this context, China and Pakistan says that they oppose this unilateral action okay and they also said that this type of actions will also complicate this kashmir issue as well so here china and pakistan they came up with this joint statement and they released after the meeting at this beijing they said that both the sides they iterated their support on issues concerning each other core interest so whenever chinese and as well as pakistan's core interest are there so in those areas they will be having some mutual support and they also said that they underscored that stronger defense and security cooperation between Pakistan and China. It is an important factor for the peace and stability in the region. So because of this stronger defense cooperation and stronger security cooperation between China and Pakistan. So it is an important reason for the stability in this region. And if you are talking about Pakistan, it also said that they were mainly committed to one China policy and they support for China in Taiwan. South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang province and Tibet. So here Pakistan which is mainly giving support for the China in these issues 
of China and Taiwan, uh, South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang province and Tibet. So China for its part, it also reaffirmed its support for the Pakistan in safeguarding its sovereignty, uh, independence and as well as security of the country, it is also going to provide the support. So in the both the sides, they re reiterated peaceful and prosperous South Asia. Okay, and the, both the sides from Chinese side and Pakistan side, they emphasized on importance of pursuit of dialogue and resolution of all outstanding disputes and they want to promote regional cooperation and they want to come up with the advancing of their goals regarding peace, stability and shared prosperity in this region. So this is about this topic and let me know your comments regarding this article in comment box. Okay. So now let us try to see other four articles which are important that appear in today's newspaper. So first one is North Korea is continuing its nuclear program says United Nations. So already you know that here North Korea which is listed under this backlist under this FATF Financial Action Task Force. Right. So even though here, here now North Korea which is mainly going for the development of nuclear and as well as missile programs despite of international sanctions. So despite of international sanctions are imposed on this country, it is further it is mainly moving for this nuclear and as well as missile programs. Okay, actually this North Korea which is under major sanctions uh, regarding this weapons program and even there are some ban regarding exports of coal, iron, lead, textiles, seafood and also some other products. So even though it is mainly going for launching of intercontinental ballistic missiles that mainly recently reported in the last year and it is also going for the production of this nuclear fissile materials that are very much helpful for the production of this nuclear weapons. Okay, so this is about this topic and even United Nations experts they noted that there is sharp increase in the quality of refined petroleum imports that is mainly seen in last year. Okay, and there is also some issues regarding cryptocurrency issues that is uh, mainly seen here and recently we are seeing that cyber attacks which are mainly seen okay which are mainly done by this North Korea so these are the some important things that are mainly said in this article and next topic it is about rare insects cited in this Sesha Chalam so here you have to open your atlas and you have to see where is this Sesha Chalam is located okay so a black percher or a black ground skimmer it is a dragonfly species which is mainly cited for the first time in this Sesha Chalam hills okay so this is the one important thing and this uh, this uh, fly okay so this uh, rare insect which is mainly belongs to phylum arthropoda and which is mainly belongs to class insecta and order odonata okay odonata okay, it is mainly belongs to this dragonfly so you can talk you can write you can make a small note of this uh, dragonfly okay so it might be important from your films and uh, next topic is about russia 70 percent combat ready for invasion says us okay now if you're talking about this russia so across this russia ukraine border so there is conflict that is happening and russia warned that ukraine should not join this nato and ukraine need to give assistance uh, ukraine need to say that it is not going to uh, join this NATO. So whenever this Ukraine which is mainly joining this NATO means what happened that will be increasing of security concerns for this uh, Russia. So because of this Russia it is mainly increasing this combat power and as well as increasing this army across this uh, Ukraine border. Okay. So in this context Russia has in place about 70 percentage of this combat power. Okay. Uh, which it mainly want to go for full invasion of this Ukraine as well. Okay, so it is also going to send uh, more battalion uh, tactical groups to this border with its neighbor. So this is the thing which mainly said by the US. So here you can revise this uh, Russia-Ukraine issue already we discussed in our earlier lectures. And next topic it is about Sita Raman to discuss aviation fuel inclusion in GST regime. So we are talking about uh, petrol, diesel and, uh, and this uh, turbine fuels that is aviation turbine fuels. They are not under ambit of this uh, GST. So because of this, if you are moving from one state to another state, the petrol and diesel prices mainly varies because they are not under this ambit of this GST. So because of this, now our finance minister, she is going to talk about whether there will be inclusion of this aviation turbine fuel in this GST or not. Okay. So after once it is done, we are going to discuss about this in detail. So we will be getting many editorials regarding this for sure. Right. So these are the topics that are important from our UPSC point of view. And now let us try to see the yesterday's questions. So first question is about due process of law. 
so in indian context the concept of due process of law was introduced in which of the following cases first one is minerva mills case second one is keshwa gandhi keshwa nand bharti case and third one is menaka gandhi case actually regarding the passport issues of uh, passport issue of this menaka gandhi and that case led to this due process of law so correct option here is answer 3 and next question it is also very simple question is regarding fundamental duty so according to indian constitution which of the following is not a fundamental duty so fundamental duties are present in our article 51a of our indian constitution so you have to by had that fundamental duties for sure because you can get a question from that topic as well so first one is right to vote in public elections and develop scientific temper to provide education for a child up to 14 years to safeguard public property so right uh, to vote in this public election is not a fundamental duty okay so correct option here is a1 and if you are talking about today's questions so before seeing this today's questions i want to make a small announcement on this platform if you want to clear this upsc csc i will strongly suggest you to join this prelims test series and as well as mains answer writing course that we are offering in our rathore's is academy so in this prelims test series there are about 30 tests which includes both csat and as well as your gs so they are very very useful okay and that will be helpful for your analysis as well so whether you are in a right direction or not and whether there is a need to change your preparation strategy and next one is mains answer writing course this mains answer writing course is very very important because mains will be the deciding factor whether your name will be there in final list or not so this mains will make or break the deal so because of this whenever you are focusing on this mains answer writing and if you are improving your mains answer writing skills and for sure i will ensure that you will your name will be there in final list because within 3 hours of time you need to answer 20 questions so on an average you will be getting 7 to 7 and 1/2 minutes for one question so now you can imagine that how fast you should be and how thorough you should be so this is a one year course and in this course we are going to give you the weekly targets of syllabus and based on that weekly target daily one question is given from monday to saturday on sunday there will be essay or case study you are going to write your answer and you are going to send your answer to our email id so that there will be evaluation will be done and we will be also providing you the modal answer such that you will be getting 5 to 10 points regarding that so and so question and even there will be the one to one mentorship that we are offering in this course actually the new batch had been started on february 1st okay on february 1st new batch started so here you need to you need to do registrations within this february 8 so february 8 the registration will be closed for this batch okay and this is very very useful course and you can believe me that you will going to excel this answer in for sure and the next one is we also came with entire foundational course for upsc csc especially for 2023 so this will be very very beneficial and we are providing more than 700 hours of video lectures and we are focusing on this conceptual clarity and each and every every single part that is a small sub topic is also discussed in this courses okay and you can completely rely on this foundation course that we are providing in this rathore's ias and if you want to take any individual uh, subjects like uh, economy history geography like that you can also take this individual courses so if you visit our website rathore's ias academy and there you can watch the demo videos of these courses so after watching demo videos you can do your payment okay and if you want to talk to me directly regarding this courses you can call to this number 8074765513 and i am the academy director of this rathore's ias academy and you can 100% trust us and now let us try to see the today's questions it is first one it is regarding dpsp director principles of state policy so there are you have to find out which are the liberal intellectual principles so in director principles of state policy we have gandhi and we have socialistic and liberal so this question is asking to identify liberal intellectual principles and next question it is regarding our article 368 and you have to see the statements are given below and find correct answers and let me know your answers in your in comment box don't forget to give your answers it will be helpful for especially to motivate you and it will be helpful for you to answer more questions it will be helpful for practicing purpose and even you can also practice elimination techniques as well and there is no negative marking here right so you can give your answers in the comment box so by this i am concluding i hope you enjoyed this lecture 
please subscribe to Rathor's IS Academy and don't forget to like, share and comment my videos and don't forget to enroll to these courses. Thank you so much.